Welcome back to um, our session four. And um, my name is Susan Martin. Um, I'm at Georgetown University, and I'm delighted to um, be moderating this session. Um, we will be uh, looking during this session at uh, capacity building at the national level. Um, but before we turn to our panelists, um, we have a special presentation from Cecile Riolant, uh, Senior Manage, uh, Migration and Development Specialist at IOM, who will be talking about migration and the 2013, 2030 agenda. Cecile? Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, good morning, um, everyone. So indeed, uh, my role will be to, uh, to introduce um, this session, but also uh, to, to focus on uh, one specific tool uh, that IOM uh, is launching today. Um, so in line with the theme of this session, I will focus my intervention um, on the need to ensure the participation of a wide range of actors operating at different levels uh, of governance for the delivery of efficient and sustainable capacity development, uh, capacity uh, development in the field of migration. I will argue that Capacity development on migration needs a common narrative to connect the many threads uh, related to migration and that the agenda 2030 for sustainable development should be this joint framework. And all the points I will make uh, in my presentation are made to inform uh, the setup of the capacity building mechanism foreseen in support of the efforts of the member states to implement the global compact on migration. So migration outcomes depend uh, on the intended or unintended interactions between migration policies and other sectoral policies such as housing, trade, health, or agriculture. So capacity development in migration therefore needs to clearly emphasize the importance of securing a whole of government approach that considers how other policies affect and are affected by migration and what sectors and actors uh, need to be mobilized. So training government officials should frame migration really as a cross-cutting issue uh, and provide them with a broad understanding of migration across different sectors. And this is really what has been achieved in the context of a global program implemented jointly by IOM and UNDP and supported by the Swiss Development Corporation uh, web that was really focused on this critical issue of policy coherence on migration and development. And it has really relied on a very strong capacity uh, development component whereby joint um, training of government officials coming from different line ministries has really facilitated as a result a joint up uh, policy making on migration. So bringing different line ministries in joint capacity development training is really important. Another dimension uh, related to the whole of government approach um, is really the need to include cities and local and regional uh, authorities in, capa in capacity development on migration. The key role of local and regional authorities has been duly recognized in the new urban agenda and the global compact on migration make uh, quite a lot of references as well to the role uh, cities and local and regional authorities have for to facilitate the implementation of the compact. So the local level where the development impact of migration is uh, the most profoundly felt is really crucial for comprehensively addressing the challenges and opportunities related to migration. These dynamics are indeed mediated by cities and local and regional actors on the ground uh, who really find themselves at the forefront of providing services to migrants and their families and to communities. So needs for capacity development of local levels of governments are enormous, really, in a context where migration is still largely perceived as a national level prerogative. So upon bringing in the local dimension uh, on capacity development on migration, there's also another very important element that I'd like to bring in, which is the one of a vertical policy coherence between national and subnational authorities through the promotion of coordination mechanisms uh, and that should be a really important component about how we deliver capacity development on migration. Specific develop, uh, capacity development tools have been already developed and are available uh, in the context of uh, the UN Joint Migration and Development Initiative, the GMDI, 
uh, which is an, uh, a program that was supported by seven agencies, the United Nations system, among which uh, IOM. And that program developed um, a specific toolbox for local decision makers on migration management. And we have so far uh, trained over 6,000 uh, stakeholders uh, using this particular tool. So the organization of joint capacity development activities bringing together local and national government officials have proven to be extremely instrumental. Along with the um, whole of government's approach, um, the participation of a wide range of actors is also paramount. When talking um, about capacity development for migration governance, it is important for states to include all relevant stakeholders, also in order to, con to contribute to the implementation of the frameworks for migration governance. So actors like recruitment agencies, uh, who play an important role in contributing to fair and ethical recruitment, diaspora organizations who play a critical role in connecting uh, migrant countries of origin and countries destination, or service providers for digital technology, for example, are all crucial and should be encompassed and included in capacity development efforts. So the capacity building mechanism uh, foreseen uh, in support of the efforts of the member states for the implementation of the GCM should therefore fully reflect the need for a whole of governance and whole of society approach. Why the primary focus of the, of the CBM is to strengthen the state's capacities in the area of migration and equip them in terms of legislation, policies and capable institutions, civil society organizations, local and regional authorities and other relevant stakeholders should also be considered uh, for support. Now I'd like to turn to uh, the second part of, uh, of my presentation, uh, which is very much in line with um, everything that I've been talking about in terms of the importance of the whole of society and whole of governance approach. And I'd like to argue that the 2030 agenda really provides us with an important framework against which capacity development on migration should be framed. Indeed, the inclusion of migration in the SDGs sets an important precedent for how migration governance can progress in the years to come. The principle of universality that underpins the goals is especially significant for migration, as it can promote national and international collaboration on the issue. The applicability of all SDG targets to all countries underlines how each has a role to play in migration and provide a framework the, uh, for progress towards more effective international governance on migration that is based on global partnership. So the inclusion of migration in the SDGs also paves the way towards greater collaboration between the migration and development sectors, and through this, towards greater policy coherence. So the 2030 uh, <coughs> agenda has been named a declaration of interdependence. It encourages going beyond governance as usual and under target 17.14, calls to pursue policy coherence and an enabling environment for sustainable development at all levels and by all actors. So the agenda require, requires stakeholders to move to a whole of governance approach to achieve policy coherence on migration governance. So the migration SDG connections reach far beyond implementing migration policies and entail integrating migration across governance sectors. So to help doing that, um, IOM uh, is launching uh, a new guide uh, for practitioners uh, on migration and the 2030 agenda. And you have copies of the guide uh, at the back of this room uh, if, you, if you want to, to, if you're interested in it. So really this guide, um, so as you can see here on the screen, we have really analyzed, um, you know, looking at the 2030 agenda, all the entry points that exist in relation to human mobility and migration. Uh, so you're, as you know, there are obvious direct entry points, but there are also cross-cutting areas. And really what this guide does is to illustrate all of those different dimensions for policymakers and, and other uh, migration practitioners alike. So it really is designed uh, to uh, serve government actors, both uh, national and local, involved uh, in <clears throat> any process of sustainable development goal implementation, including those working specifically in migration and those working in other sectors uh, who are interested uh, in integrating migration. 
So it is also for government actors working uh, in the migration field who wish to integrate the SDGs into their work. So these interventions uh, take the form of legislation, policies, programs, projects, or other activities, and may relate to core migration topics or integrate migration into activities in another sector. So for example, uh, policymakers may use this guide uh, to align uh, interventions that directly address victims of trafficking, um, as well as interventions in the health sector uh, that help protect those victims of trafficking. So, you know, those, looking at all these different entry points uh, for different policy objectives. So, for actors uh, with experience in migration mainstreaming, uh, this guide offers a new approach that is really based on the 2030 agenda. And for those with no experience uh, in migration mainstreaming, it offers uh, an introduction on how migration and development are linked in the context of the SDGs and how to take action uh, around uh, these connections. So uh, section one uh, of the guise is, is really a thematic overview of the ways in which uh, migration is included in the 2030 agenda and really zoom on the main opportunities that it presents and it offers a thematic exploration of direct um, cross-cutting uh, connections uh, throughout the, 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 the agenda. And it really enables uh, actors to consider how the SDGs are most relevant to their particular local and national migration context. Uh, section two, and this is what you have here on the, on the screen, um, offers a, a, a full a step uh, process uh, that really provides for operational guidance and suggested pro uh, processes for implementing uh, migration aspects of the SDGs. Uh, but it really is a flexible framework um, and that can be modified and adjusted, uh, you know, to fit local and national context, of course. So the process is not intended at all to be prescriptive or exhaustive, but uh, it really helps policymakers uh, to respond to, to, no to national and, lo uh, and local migration dynamics in their own institutional context. So it goes through a stage of a, a kickoff, prioritization, implementation, and monitoring and reporting. And throughout those different steps, uh, you know, we are really providing very concrete uh, ways to do it, illustrated as well by case studies about how governments around the world have gone about this process. So it's really hands-on. And, and we hope uh, that uh, it, will, it will help you uh, in, in uh, articulating the 2030 agenda with, uh, with, your, with policy making at national level. Um, so in conclusion, um, I'd like to, to say that um, really the, 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 um, the capacity building mechanism of the GCM really has the potential uh, to ensure uh, an efficient use of the existing technical, financial, and human resources for strengthen capacities and multi-partner cooperation. But as we know, there are, there are a number of, of capacity development tools that currently exist. A lot of, of, of is already on the table. So really what is critical now is how we are able to join those different tools that we have. And what, uh, how are we going to do that? And really doing it against the, the, the pattern of, or the framework of policy coherence, you know, str strongly anchored in the 2030 agenda should be one of the guiding principles as we move uh, forward uh, in designing this uh, capacity building mechanism. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you uh, for those um, words. Um, I plan to, as we begin our session looking at the national um, assessing capacity development needs of uh, national actors in promoting solutions. Um, I think we need to recall some of the discussion from yesterday and the experiences we've had. Um, where it's very clear that national authorities have the um, primary responsibility, of course, for migration management, um, but also for the implementation of the SDGs. So in many ways, this session, I think, is at the very heart of what the entire discussions um, have been uh, leading towards. Um, and when we talk about national authorities, as we've just heard, though, um, not only do we need to think about a whole of government approaches within the national government itself, but also how that national government um, interacts with 
um, all of the other actors that are necessary um, to be involved in um, the implementation um, of the Global Compact, um, whether it's local authorities or um, migrant and diaspora groups, um, civil society more generally, um, international organizations as well. Um, I think we'll be hearing a, a range of perspectives on these issues today um, that will be very useful in moving forward with the um, implementation. Um, I'm going to introduce um, our four speakers um, first and then let each of them um, proceed. Um, our first speaker will be um, His Excellency Mr. Pablo Cesar Garcia Sainz. Um, he's the Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Guatemala. Um, he's had an extensive uh, diplomatic career in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, and um, is the rank of Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenitentiary of the Republic of Guatemala. Um, he's also served as General Counsel of Guatemala in Los Angeles and in New York. Um, he'll be followed by uh, Mr. Martin de Mello Barbazo. Um, he is the Secretary for Strategic Initiatives of the Special Secretariat for Strategic Affairs of the Presidency of Brazil. And he is a specialist in public policy and government management. Um, our third speaker will be uh, Mr. Ken Okaniwa. He is, um, was appointed Ambassador Deputy Permanent Representative of Japan to international organizations and Chief of Consulate Office in Geneva. Um, he was previously the Consul General of Japan in uh, Miami. And then our final speaker um, will be uh, Ms. Sima Gatia. Um, she's a social entrepreneur and transcultural migration expert um, and is the founder of Singa Deutschland and she uses co-creative and social innovation to experiment with more sustainable and impact-driven approaches to integration. Um, and so um, we'll begin with you, Mr. Sainz. Señora moderadora Martin. Señores panelistas, señores delegados. Para Guatemala es un verdadero honor participar en este taller, el cual enriquece el diálogo sobre una realidad que vivimos todos los países como lo es el tema migratorio. Personalmente agradezco la oportunidad que se me brinda para que en mi calidad de viceministro de Relaciones Exteriores pueda compartir la experiencia que nuestro país tiene en este tema, lo cual es de suma importancia para mi gobierno. El eje prioritario de la política exterior de Guatemala hoy día lo, lo tiene el tema migratorio, considerando que somos un país de origen, tránsito, destino y retorno. Es por eso que nuestro compromiso es el de velar por el pleno respeto al cumplimiento de los derechos humanos de todas las personas migrantes, independientemente de su condición migratoria. En materia consular y migratoria se han precisado importantes avances, como ampliar y fortalecer la red consular guatemalteca, con miras a prestar un mejor servicio a la comunidad guatemalteca en el exterior y dar una eficaz y oportuna atención, asistencia y protección en cuanto a la documentación de guatemaltecos en el exterior, asimismo una atención específica a niñas, niños y adolescentes migrantes no acompañados y acompañados. En ese contexto, Guatemala celebró un logro muy importante como lo fue la finalización de las negociaciones del documento que dan vida al Pacto Mundial para una Migración Segura, Ordenada y Regular, cuya base es la protección de los derechos de las personas migrantes, siendo una valiosa oportunidad para reconocer el aporte de la migración para el desarrollo de todas las sociedades. En ese contexto, quiero comentarles que el Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores de Guatemala, con el apoyo de la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones, llevó a cabo un taller y consulta interinstitucional durante el mes de octubre del año pasado, el cual tuvo el nombre de Rumbo al Pacto Mundial sobre Migración, en el que se contó con la participación de todas las instituciones de gobierno involucradas en el tema migratorio para la construcción de una posición de país de cara a la negociación que tuviera lugar este año. Siendo nuestro principal eje el tema migratorio, Guatemala también ha participado activamente durante las seis negociaciones que se dieron lugar en Nueva York, de las cuales se destacó de manera enfática y continua la promoción de los siguientes principios. 
1. Enfoque integral basado en la protección de los derechos humanos de las personas migrantes y sus familias, principalmente las niñas, niños y adolescentes migrantes no acompañados y acompañados, así como unidades familiares. 2. Contribución de las migraciones y las diásporas en el desarrollo económico, social y cultural de los países de destino y origen. 3. Lucha contra la xenofobia, discriminación, racismo y otras formas de intolerancia contra las personas migrantes. 4. La no criminalización de las personas migrantes. 5. La no detención de niñas y niños adolescentes migrantes. 6. La reunificación de las familias. Y 7. Apoyar a la creación de programas de migración ordenada, segura y regular, como lo son los programas de trabajadores temporales en países desarrollados. A partir del reconocimiento de estos principios, Guatemala manifestó a través de sus intervenciones que la migración debe ser abordada desde un enfoque de derechos humanos y no exclusivamente en un enfoque basado en la seguridad. Es por esto que vimos la necesidad de asegurar la no detención de niñas y niños adolescentes migrantes por motivos migratorios, así como hacer atención y protección una prioridad máxima de la gobernanza migratoria en el estricto apego al interés superior del niño, garantizando siempre el derecho a la reunificación con su familia. Por otra parte, Guatemala ha iniciado con la transternalización del tema migratorio en la Agenda 2030 y los Objetivos del Desarrollo Sostenible en el marco de la Conferencia Regional sobre Migración. En este contexto, me es grato compartirles que Guatemala en el próximo mes recibirá la presidencia pro tempore de la Conferencia Regional sobre Migración, un foro multilateral donde se comparten las experiencias y buenas prácticas de 11 países sobre derechos humanos y las personas migrantes y gestión migratoria. De esta manera, reafirmamos nuestro compromiso y responsabilidad en pro de las personas migrantes, esperando desde la presidencia promover acciones en su beneficio y viabilizar el vínculo entre la migración y el desarrollo, por lo que desde ya agradecemos la labor de los países miembros de esta conferencia. Como ya lo he indicado, para Guatemala es prioritario el tema y respeto a la garantía de los derechos del interés superior del niño como base para todos los países y la protección a la niñez y a la adolescencia, así como el pleno respeto a la reunificación familiar, considerando que la familia es el centro de nuestra sociedad. El gobierno de Guatemala ha demostrado su fiel compromiso de velar en todo momento por los connacionales en el exterior, principalmente aquellas poblaciones más vulnerables como lo son las niñas y los niños y los migrantes adolescentes. Durante muestra de ello es la definición de un modelo de protección consular para niñas y niños y adolescentes migrantes con un enfoque de derechos humanos que pretende en toda fase del proceso migratorio la promoción, el respeto y la garantía de los principios del interés superior del niño, la reunificación de su familia, el debido proceso y el acceso a las medidas de protección internacional. Toda situación que se vea afectada, la niñez y la adolescencia, requiere de los estados acciones inmediatas y además la consolidación de una sinergia de todas las instituciones para una correcta determinación del interés superior de los niños y los adolescentes. Conscientes de esta realidad, en el marco del Tricamex, un mecanismo de alianza en conjunto con los países hermanos de México, El Salvador y Honduras, Guatemala organizó en la capital guatemalteca en el mes de julio una reunión para la definición de las estrategias conjuntas en materia migratoria y de seguridad entre los cancilleres de estos países y la Secretaria de Seguridad Nacional de los Estados Unidos de América, lo en donde se abordó el tema integral, el tema migratorio y principalmente la reunificación de familias. Como resultado de esta reunión, hemos establecido una ruta de trabajo para el intercambio de información que facilite la notificación consular de las personas migrantes de los países miembros del Tricamex que se han ingresado a los Estados Unidos de América con el fin de facilitar la actuación consular y los procesos migratorios de manera inmediata. Es por esto que el ordenamiento de los flujos migratorios es también un tema prioritario para el país. Por ello es importante establecer procesos migratorios seguros, ordenados y respetuosos de los derechos humanos de la población migrante. El Ministerio de Relaciones Exteriores de Guatemala, como representante del Estado en el exterior, es el responsable de velar por el respeto de los derechos de los guatemaltecos, de los trabajadores migratorios, todo ello sin importar el estatus en el cual se encuentran y brindar una asistencia y protección consular correspondiente. Los principales flujos de trabajadores que tenemos en Guatemala hoy se priorizan en Canadá y los Estados Unidos mexicanos. Se tiene el registro de 7.526 connacionales guatemaltecos trabajando de manera temporal en México y 6.280 en Canadá. 
Quiero comentar también que se está explorando una nueva área de labor en otros países en donde se está impulsando una migración segura, ordenada y regular. Una de las partes fundamentales para el alcance de una eficaz gobernanza de la migración es el adecuado marco legal y es por ello que en el año 2016 en Guatemala fue aprobado el Código de Migración bajo el Decreto 44-2016 del Congreso de la República de Guatemala, el cual constituye un proceso de aportes intersectoriales, crea una nueva institucionalidad y contiene todo un enfoque de principios y derechos básicos, colocando a la persona migrante como el centro y sujeto de derecho. Actualmente se continúa en los procesos de la construcción de una reglamentación que mandata el mismo código para protección de todos los migrantes. En el tema consular, quiero compartir con ustedes que uno de los proyectos más importantes es la ampliación de la red consular. Para este año se ha tenido planificada la apertura de dos consulados más en los Estados Unidos de América y uno en los Estados Unidos mexicanos. Esto permitirá acercar el servicio a nuestra comunidad. Actualmente contamos con 41 secciones consulares y 32 consulados. Otro de los objetos dentro de nuestra política exterior es el fortalecimiento de incrementar la presencia de Guatemala en foros internacionales que aborden el tema migratorio con miras a incidir en las decisiones multilaterales internacionales que a largo plazo se expresan en la política nacional. Es por ello que aplaudimos la labor de la OIM para la organización de estos espacios de diálogo. Asimismo, en el marco del proyecto MISIC, Guatemala ha impulsado varias acciones para el fortalecimiento de la capacidad en materia de preparación para situación de crisis y protección de la población migrante en casos de emergencia. Con el apoyo de la OIM se brindó una capacitación al cuerpo consular acreditado en nuestro país para dar a conocer las acciones que hemos emprendido en estos temas. De igual manera, las misiones diplomáticas y consulares de Guatemala en el exterior ahora cuentan con un manual de contingencia en casos de emergencia o desastres y también con el apoyo de la OIM se realizará la impresión que estos manuales se necesita para darlos en el exterior. Les quiero compartir que recientemente se presentó el perfil de gobernanza migratoria por parte de la OIM, el cual permitirá servir en una hoja de ruta de revisión, el fortalecimiento y el diseño de nuevas políticas que den un enfoque de gobierno integral y la búsqueda de una clara normativa del funcionamiento institucional basado en el contexto migratorio de Guatemala. Por último, Guatemala considera importante fortalecer la cooperación entre los distintos actores, tanto gubernamentales, la sociedad civil, la academia, el sector privado y los organismos internacionales, incluidos la Organización Internacional para las Migraciones y la necesidad de una constante coordinación interagencial dentro de Naciones Unidas para abordar el tema del Pacto Mundial sobre Migración. En este contexto queremos agradecer nuevamente a la OIM no solo la invitación para participar en este taller, sino por toda la labor que realiza desde la Oficina Regional para Guatemala y todo su equipo quienes han realizado una destacada labor en beneficio de la comunidad migrante. Muchas gracias. Um, thank you so much for those remarks, and uh, particularly for um, really focusing on some of these major you know, sort of human interest aspects of migration policy with the focus on children, um, and then the end on uh, dealing with disasters. And certainly as um, the U.S., we are now into the hurricane season, and, uh, and these issues are of particular concern. So thank you. Um, Mr. Barbosa. Thank you very much, uh, the moderator, uh, speakers, and participants of this dialogue. First of all, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to be here. It's an honor to speak in front of such a qualified audience. And I'll try to convey some information, a picture of what is happening nowadays in Brazil regarding our migration policies and how we're trying to build capacity to uh, cope with the migration events that we have experienced in recent years. Historically speaking, migration was an important event in Brazil. We are a country of migrants. But in recent decades, I can tell you that maybe in the past two or three decades, migration was kind of off the radar of our government authorities for one simple reason, because migrants, even though the number is relevant, we have now 
1.1 million, 1 .1 million people, migrants living in Brazil, it does not represent an important share of our total population. For a country with 200 million people, we now have less than 1% of migrants in our country. And the same applies to the Brazilians living abroad. We have, if I'm not wrong, 1.6, 1.8 million Brazilians living abroad. Uh, so it also represents less than 1% of our total population. But things started to change around 2013, 14, when we started to see in the news uh, information about the arrival of Haitians in Brazil. So we experienced an important arrival of Haitian citizens uh, in Brazil in a matter of few years, maybe in two or three years, they became the second largest migrant group in our country. Mm -hmm. And the arrival of those migrants highlighted uh, three important problems we had, Th three, if I can say, flaws or difficulties we had. First of all, we realized that we had an outdated legislation. Our previous migrant law was created with concerns of national security, so migrants were treated more as a threat uh, instead of being an opportunity for the country. Uh, it also highlighted the existence of a government deficit lack of coordination among government institutions. And we also realized that there was a lot of misinformation about the migrant situation and migrant rights, not only about government officials, but also among the private and the society as a whole. Even the migrants, they didn't know what were their rights. So in order to uh, attack these three main issues, the government implemented two actions. First of all, it reinforced the role of our National Migration Chamber. This National Migration, Migration Chamber is hosted at the Ministry of Labor, and it comprises 20 government members with rights to vote and 13 observers, the IOMF included. And this chamber is responsible for the guidelines of national migration policies. It also coordinates the government ac activities related to migration policies and analyzes and issues recommendations on legislative proposals related to migration or on issues which can affect the lives of migrants in our country. So this was one of the first actions adopted. And as a consequence, we also approved a new migration law in 2017. Some of the principles I can highlight about this new migration law the non-criminalization of migration, this was an important evolution, the right of migrants to become residents if they want to, a faster naturalization process, less documents required, and it's much faster today than in the previous years. Uh, it's more flexible for working visas as well. Those who want to work and don't want to become residents, they have a faster process to acquire their visas. And the, the new legislation also have goals of social inclusion, uh, especially the right to have access to education, public education, public health, legal assistance, and banking services. So this was a, an, an important evolution compared to what we had before. And in recent years, we also had an important event worth mentioning, which was the arrival of migrants from Venezuela. It, it became a kind of a stress test for the government for a, a few reasons. First of all, as in the case of the Haitians, they, the migrants from Venezuela arrived in a short time span. I mean, they arrived very quickly. And in 2015, we had 1,000 uh, uh, citizens from Venezuela living in Brazil. And in 2018, this number jumped to 95,000. Uh, dividing between asylum seekers and residents. So it became a fast process, and it also became a problem, a difficulty for the government for one reason. You can see here uh, the demographic density map of Brazil, and the parts in, in yellow represent uh, what we call the Amazon area. This is where the Amazon rainforest is located. And you can see from the map that it's a scarcely populated area. There is almost no one living there, just a few major cities. 
and the infrastructure is almost non-existent as, is existent as well. We have few roads and few airports in this whole region. And the difficulty, the problem for the government is that the migrants started to arrive at the north of the country, I mean the most isolated area in the country, and they are now uh, in most, they're, they're basically now located at the state of Roraima, which is a small state in the northern part of the country, and they also have low human index indicators. So their situation today is that this state has half a million people uh, of Brazilians li living there. We have half a million Brazilians living there. And now we have 71,000 migrants from Venezuela. Today they represent 14% of the total population. And it, it created some pressure on, uh, how can I say, social services related to health, security, and labor as well. And if these migrants want to move to other parts of the country, I mean, if they want to go from Roraima to Sao Paulo, which is the largest city in Brazil, where they can find better job opportunities, they will have to take a long trip, 63 hours by car, almost 5,000 kilometers. And for this reason, and many other reasons as well, they're still living there. Most of the Venezuelans are still living in Roraima, and as I can show you here, they now, uh, now 74% of the Venezuelans in Brazil are still in the state of Roraima. So which actions the government has decided to implement? The first one uh, at the local level was the decision to establish partnerships with international organizations, religious groups, and NGOs. And this was a tremendous and super important decision because these organizations, they have the agility, capacity, and flexibility that governments don't have. And the government, I mean the federal government, also tried to, is trying to support the states and the municipality. In Brazil, we are a, a federation. We have three levels of government, the central government, the state government, and the municipalities. And now the government is trying to support the state of Roraima to uh, help them in welcoming these migrants in the most efficient possible way. And the government is also trying to provide public service at the border. And those are identification and data collection, information about migrants' rights, and it, it became super important because we realized after a few days that the migrants, they didn't know what were their own rights. So we're trying to emphasize this uh, point in order to make the migrants more aware of what are their rights. Uh, we are also providing health care and vaccines, shelter and food for those who need it, and now we are serving 17,000 meals per day. Each day we're serving to those migrants 17,000 meals, and we are trying to move these migrants to larger cities. Before I, st I talk about the movement of these migrants to larger cities, I also want to emphasize one important aspect of this, of this event, uh, which was a decision to centralize all the actions at the Presidency of the Republic. So all the actions regarding government activities were centralized. We created a, a task force at the Presidency of the Republic, and it made a huge difference. So in order to move these migrants to larger cities, to give them jobs and opportunities for a better life, uh, we have to, first of all, identify cities with potential to absorb these migrants, which became a, a, a challenge as well, because in Brazil we have a, a, a large unemployment rate. We have today almost 13 million people without jobs, uh, trying to find jobs in our country. So accommodating those migrants, especially in a situation where they don't speak Portuguese, became a, a, a main challenge for the government. So we're establishing meetings with local authority and civil society organizations. As I said before, we have to have these civil society organizations on our side, otherwise the, the movement will not be efficient. And we're trying to also convey information to the private sector. Uh, and it also uh, is this issue is also crucial because we realized that the private sector in most cases was afraid to provide jobs for those migrants because they did not know what were their labor rights. So we were trying to 
clarify this to make them more comfortable uh, to hire migrants from Venezuela. And we are also making workshops with lo local government stakeholders to clarify, share information, and design proper policies at the local level. The road ahead, is the situation perfect? No, it is not. We still have a lot of things to do. And I would like to emphasize a few uh, questions which are still being attacked by the government and which deserve some effort, will be deserving some effort in the near future. First of all, we still have to improve the data collection and prediction of better information about the situation of migrants, especially surveys with the migrants to understand what were the obstacles they were encountering when they come to our country and when they try to find jobs and when they try to live in our society. We also have to reduce bureaucracy. Quick access to documents is crucial for these migrants and we realize that the issue of working permits, for example, still takes some time, more than it should. Uh, we have to improve coordination between government agencies. We have three main databases uh, regarding migrants in our country, one at the Ministry of Labor, the second at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and the third at the Ministry of Justice. And these three databases are not interconnected, so if we want to find information about migrants, we have to close one database, open another, and for someone who is at the frontier, it becomes, it becomes a, a, a difficulty, a challenge. We have to enhance the capacity of civil society for reasons I already explained. We have to provide these civil society organizations with more resources, and we have to treat them as important partners. And finally, we have to, we still have to disseminate migrants' rights among the private and the public sectors, especially on a circumstance where the new migrant law was approved in last year. Uh, I mean, it's very recent. Most people still don't know what are the migrant rights. And we are trying to uh, set some workshops with important stakeholders in the government sector to make them more aware of what are the migrants' rights. So this was a, a brief picture, a brief explanation about how we're trying to build capacity in our country. It's, a, it's an example of what Brazil is doing. I know that the realities and the circumstances and the challenges of other countries are different from ours, but I think it can raise some debate and I'm, I will be happy to answer to the questions you have. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, uh, both for the update on uh, what's happening to Venezuelans in Brazil, um, but also that last slide was very illuminating in terms of priorities for capacity building um, based on your recent experience. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Acevedo? Uh, thank you, Susan. I. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, give a presentation uh, on human security and migration. Um, before starting my presentation, uh, uh, allow me to express Japan's support to the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. Uh, the Global Compact incorporates uh, many of the uh, elements of uh, human security approach. Uh, namely human-centered, 360 degrees vision and multi-stakeholder approach. And, uh, and also the uh, SDGs, the uh, 2020 uh, SDG also incorporates uh, many of the elements. Um, and, what? Uh, oh, I put it off. And, and that's, not a, that's not a coincidence uh, because human security is a concept that Japan has been promoting uh, in the international community since uh, the 1990s uh, in collaboration with United UN member states and international organizations, including IOM and other stakeholders. Uh, of course, Japan has also been uh, promoting uh, or taking the human security approach in its uh, bilateral 
aid uh, projects and programs. Human security is based on a fundamental and mutual understanding that governments play the primary role in ensuring the survival, livelihoods, and dignity of their citizens. It is the uh, governments which have a responsibility to protect uh, the, their citizens. Uh, but the concept goes beyond the traditional nation-centered framework and focuses on lives of individuals, uh, focusing on uh, their potential to realize a, uh, their uh, potential and also to realize a rich and sustainable society uh, through empowerment of uh, the people. Uh, since the political, economic, social, and cultural conditions for human security vary significantly within and across countries, uh, the cross-cutting and comprehensive approach of human security is effective in responding to migration issues. And I think the, uh, the, uh, some of the elements uh, of uh, taking a whole, well, whole government approach, uh, looking at the uh, uh, various an human security threats from various angles is something that was mentioned by some of my previous speakers. Uh, by focusing on alleviating uh, human suffering and improving lives at the individual level, it facilitates uh, collaboration between governments, uh, including the local authorities, international organizations, NGOs, civil societies, and the private sector. In 2012, the UN General Assembly adopted a resolution on human security in which the concept was defined as people-centered, comprehensive, context-specific, and prevention-oriented. It is a people-centered approach ensuring the survival, livelihood, and dignity of the people, dealing with cross-cutting risks. Uh, it is a context-specific uh, approach considering the root causes of problems and risks in uh, various ways. It is also prevention-oriented, uh, namely by proactively identifying and addressing risks that exist now and also into the future. Secretary General Antonio Guterres referred to human security as one of the interrelated dimensions, along with state security and or national security and public security. In his report last December entitled Making Migration Work for All, uh, he also mentioned uh, the importance of human security for the international community to respond to the complex global threats and challenges when he made a special lecture in Tokyo uh, last December uh, on global challenges, the role of human security. Uh, to promote this approach, Japan spearheaded the establishment of the United Nations Trust Fund for U un uh, Human Security in 1999. Since uh, its, its establishment, Japan has consistently been the main donor of the fund. Uh, between 1999 and 2017, the fund has committed over $400 million to 243 projects in over 95 countries around the world. Uh, for the sake of time, uh, I will uh, not explain uh, individual projects, uh, but I think that I will try to uh, generally uh, explain how these projects are uh, formulated and uh, implemented. Um, there is uh, one project in uh, Somalia which was uh, adopted in 2017 
uh, which includes uh, IOM as one of the, uh, I guess, the international organizations uh, proposing the project. Uh, in this project, uh, achieving local solutions to displacement crises in uh, Somalia. Uh, IOM and other UN organi organizations address multiple challenges uh, relating to uh, protect protracted internal displacement, uh, large-scale return of uh, Somali refugees from uh, neighboring countries, and new displacement due to conflict within uh, Somalia and also drought uh, through a pilot project in uh, Jubaland region. In applying a human security approach, the first step uh, involves undertaking a context-specific human security analysis. Uh, main determinants of human security uh, insecurity for the vulnerable people are identified in a wide range of areas and at various levels, such as personal insecurity, economic, environmental, and health insecurities. In the specific case of uh, uh, this project, threats to human security include violence, poverty, unemployment, lack of adequate housing, inadequate basic services, infectious and other disease, and the impact of natural hazards such as drought. Once an analysis is done, the second step will be to formulate a strategy that will integrate the roles of various stakeholders concerned and comprehensively deal with the diverse range of threats to human security. For the human security approach to work it is essential that all the important stakeholders participate in the process, starting from analysis to formulation of strategy, implementation, and the monitoring and evaluation uh, process. Human security aims at empowering the displacement affected communities and promoting capacity development of uh, the uh, communities. Uh, this is uh, very important to support the community in this way and empower them because uh, in some, many cases, uh, the government's capacity is too weak and, uh, and they cannot adequately deal with the uh, challenges. And through the project, the affected individuals and community will become more self-reliant. We also support the government. The government will become more accountable and better able to respond to the needs of the displacement affected community. By emphasizing empowerment and capacity development, the project will seek to contribute to durable solutions in the affected areas. The project was funded in 2017 and uh, implementation has just begun. But uh, once the pilot project is completed, uh, it is expected that lessons learned and best practices will be used to mainstream uh, the human security approach into future programming in Somali. I hope that the results of this project will be a useful input to the global knowledge platform uh, administered by the IOM in accordance with the Global Compact on Migration. Uh, human security is originally a concept adopted in the context of peace and security, but it is useful in dealing with other challenges, including migration, and also the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable development. The approach is useful in addressing complex factor, uh, complex uh, issues uh, and the, all the root causes of problems. Uh, to promote this approach, uh, Japan welcomes extended support or expanded support to the fund from uh, more members of the international community. Thank you for your attention. 
Yes, uh, thank you so much for um, both introducing the concept of human security into our discussions today. Uh, we've heard a lot about human rights and development and human security is another way of cutting into those um, issues. Um, and also for uh, talking about capacity um, development in the context of prevention and solutions. I think that also adds a, a re really interesting um, element to what we'll be talking about um, on that. Um, will you wrap things up for us in the presentations? So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, we are going to um, end this session uh, with some energy and maybe some space to really reflect on uh, you know, how our own teams are actually approaching this topic and what we can really do differently to um, really embrace the spirit of a whole of society approach, not just in theory, but also in practice. Um, I had the impression yesterday that, um, you know, there's a lot of willingness in the room, which I'm very impressed uh, to hear, a lot of willingness in the room to really uh, embrace this compact and put it into practice. but. The, maybe the tools and the methods uh, on how to actually do that, um, I, I, yeah, I feel that there's still room for potential, you know, to, uh, to really explore them. So I'm happy to uh, share a few ideas with you today on how this whole topic of multi-stakeholder cooperation and whole society approach can look, and I'm very curious to hear your feedback. So my name is Seema, and I am uh, very happy to present Singa today. Um, uh, Singa is an organization that I founded in Germany three years ago, and I will get to the details in a moment. So the first question um, I, I asked myself when I founded an organization in the space of migration and integration was, how can a sense of belonging help to reveal individuals' potential? And I'd like all of you to take one moment to reflect on a time in your life, it could be from childhood, it could be from a meeting last week, when you felt that uh, you weren't really welcomed or you weren't really feeling that you have a place or at least not the place you felt you deserved. And was there anyone in that moment that actually sort of created a space and created an opening for you? Maybe it was a grandparent, maybe it was a cousin, maybe it was a colleague, maybe it was someone totally unexpected. It could be a small moment or a big moment. But think about the role that that person played in that moment and how maybe by creating a space where suddenly, ah, oh, okay, I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm welcomed here. Suddenly you had all these ideas and you had all this energy and you had you know, a, a, an ability to really express and to, to um, fulfill your potential. So this is the question that Singa tries to answer every day. Um, and uh, this is a picture from a Sprachcafé, a language cafe that we have in Berlin. Um, here you can see uh, Lore. She's become a really great friend of mine. And what I love about this picture is that it not only emphasizes this um, question of how migrants and refugees and foreigners and all these scary people can you know, participate in integration, but we often forget about the role of locals. You know, locals have maybe even a more important role to play in making their societies open, and they want to. In 2015 in Germany, we experienced an incredible um, will, a willingness to engage by civil society. There were more organizations founded in Germany in 2015, 2016 in the, in the field of migration than ever before in history. So obviously there's an interest, but sometimes people need uh, an invitation to get involved, also the locals. Okay. Uh, we heard from a presentation this morning, uh, the Migrant Voices, which I found a very interesting panel, um, that the word migrant is most often associated with the word illegal. Language is power. We tend to use the word refugee, we tend to use the word migrant in a lot of the work uh, that we are doing, and yet uh, we're not always aware of the stigmas that are associated with those terms. And you know, I always find it so ironic when people say that they're working on inclusion, they're working on integration, whole of society, you know, all these great things, but then they use really um, 
specific, they, they use language that is actually exclusive. They speak about refugees and nationals, or migrants and locals. You've already taken two steps back before you can take two steps forward. So at Singa, we also try to use a transcultural approach, uh, which goes beyond the usual intercultural approach. If you're interested, I can <laughs> tell you more about it later. Uh, and uh, as part of this approach, we actually are very, very interested in the language that we use. So you will see in a moment uh, the at least uh, interim solution we found for this term. Over the past six years, we have tried to innovate uh, in all kinds of spaces, um, in tech, in housing, uh, in Germany, more, more specifically in uh, employment and entrepreneurship, to see how different kinds of programs, whether it's a business incubator, whether it's professional mentoring, whether it's Sprachcafe, um, living room storytelling, you know, which spaces actually create that dynamic where people can really, really connect and, and, um, and create together. So, as you see here, um, the solution that we've uh, come up with, at least uh, in Germany for now, is to refer to uh, connecting newcomers and locals. And what I love about the term newcomer, uh, by the way, I'm from Canada originally, and in Canada, actually, newcomer is uh, actually an official term, <laughs> uh, and it refers to um, anyone that has been living in the country for less than three years, regardless of status, refugee, international student, husband, wife, expat, whatever, you're a newcomer. And what I like about the word newcomer, even beyond Canada, is that it's not really a political term. It's not a political status in the sense of refugee or asylum seeker. Um, and again, when we're trying or claiming to work on a whole of society approach of integration, it means we have to create a space where people feel welcomed uh, to contribute, welcome to get engaged, you know. And the moment you label them directly with very exclusive and often stigmatizing terminology, you're not really doing uh, your job to create that space or that entry point. So language is very important. And I'm happy to say that Singa has managed to reach um, new levels and we continue to get um, uh, questions from cities around the world uh, that they want to start Singa, you know, in Sao Paulo or, uh, you know, here in Geneva. We're very happy to have started very recently. My colleague from Singa Geneva is here uh, with me, uh, Giordano, so feel free if anyone is in Geneva and you want to connect, uh, we're also here. Um, but here you can see um, that we've engaged in scaling um, mainly around Europe, but slowly we're, we're reaching uh, cities uh, also outside of Europe. Um, and what I want to now talk about with you, we've done the transcultural co-creation stuff, uh, now I want to talk with you about scaling, but not the usual type of scaling. I want to talk about how to scale impact. And again, uh, yesterday I, I heard, I heard the, the echo from many of you that you want to know, okay, we want to cooperate and we have you know, we whole society approach, so many, many different stakeholders are important, and you have working groups now within the IOM, UN, that's great, and you have goals, and we have many, many objectives here in the compact, and the question is always, how do we actually work together? You know, where to start? So, I want to share um, a new form of networking with you that comes from the field of social entrepreneurship. Um, so, Singa is a social business, um, so maybe this can also uh, offer some, some insight. How do we usually build networks? Whether it's on a personal level or a professional level, we put ourselves in the middle, of course, and we think, okay, who do I need around me to move my objectives forward? So uh, whether, let's say you're an organization and you say you wanna grow. Okay, so I need you know, maybe funding partners, I need uh, press, I need marketing, I need financial, legal, whatever. You put yourself in the middle and you pull the resources that you need around you, right? Normal, to move forward. This is how we were taught to do things and this is very normal. The interesting thing with uh, scaling impact is that research has shown that this approach doesn't really work. Why? Because guess what? All of those partners are doing the same thing. So they're also putting themselves in the middle. And as long as you keep putting your own organization in the middle and your own structural needs in the middle, impact is always going to be a second priority. So what I'd like to propose to you is a model that comes from Ashoka. I'm not sure if any of you know of Ashoka. It's the largest uh, network of social entrepreneurs worldwide, and they have amazing theories and amazing impact stuff. 
Uh, and one of my favorite concepts from them, and this is what I think is, if you take one thing from this presentation, please take this. Uh, it's the notion of smart networks. So again, this is a, a, a notion of how to scale impact. Now, you can see we have just made one switch. We've taken me out of the center, and we've put our impact goal in the center. So now we ask ourselves, okay, let's say, I don't know, take any objective you want from the global compact, turn it into a, ideally an actionable impact goal, and you ask yourself, okay, who, which actors does this impact goal need in order to move forward? Maybe, hopefully, you are one of those actors, although maybe not, and then you should fill yourself out completely. Don't waste your resources. Put them where you're, wh where you're good at. But let's assume that, yeah, yeah I'm a very important uh, actor in this space. Let's say Singa, for example. We feel we're a very important act actor in the space of innovation and innovating around connections. But, of course, we need funders. Of course, we need uh, press. Of course, we need all the types of other actors. And so we, when we reach out to actors, we tell them what our impact goal is, and we tell them how they can contribute to that goal. So sure, they're partnering with us, but the, the idea is not to partner with Singa. The idea is to move an impact goal forward. So uh, yeah, if I come now to the <laughs> maybe last slide, uh, to my recommendation, uh, I would encourage all of you here today, especially those representing countries, to go back to your teams and to have an honest conversation with your team and to say, OK, we have 23 objectives. Of course, we're not going to work on all of them probably ever, and we're not going to work on all of them right away. However, maybe there are one or two or three that are really, really a priority now. So be very clear with your team, which objectives do you want to focus on directly in the next three years? And formulate those objectives into measurable impact goals. And then, now comes the fun part, uh, create funding opportunities for local, multi-stakeholder actors to create smart networks. And this has to happen also on the very local level. So we heard a lot of talk about mayors and you know local administration. I think mayors have a huge role to play in fostering the creation of smart networks in their cities all around your countries. Um, I have a lot more <laughs> to share, but I think uh, the time is running. Uh, and I hope that you have questions and, and um, ideas. And of course, uh, uh, if you want to get in touch, I would be very happy to share some more uh, insight and input into this. Uh, you can come up and find me afterwards, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, and uh, particularly for raising the issue of scale, because as we talk about capacity development, I think there are a lot of good ideas, there are a lot of topics about which capacity needs to be developed, um, but scaling it up to the point where we could actually uh, make a larger impact um, is another issue. So um, thank you for getting us onto that topic.